Hey everyone. In this video, I want to talk about how we can think about protecting our resources with a, a focus on our Azure resources. As always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment, and share is appreciated, and hit that bell icon. Now, my focus is on protecting the resources, but I'll also touch on some of the considerations around obviously ransomware. That's a big deal right now. But as I hope to show, it's really not any different in terms of our planning, our protection, than just thinking about our regular, how do we protect our resources? Now, I wanna start off actually completely not talking about technology at all. I wanna talk about something in my house. So I can think about, I have my home. So I'll just quickly draw a very bad house over here. My house does normally have a roof, but we won't draw it in here. Now, if I think about my house, I have different entry points into my house. I have kind of a front door. There might be windows. There might be kind of a, a, a back door in there as well. So I have my home. And obviously, in terms of that home, we have these entry points. Now, first of all, we want strong protection. I think about protecting those entry points. So we think about, well, yeah, we have kind of locks on the doors. Maybe we have kind of sensors on the windows. We have maybe a lock on the back door. Maybe we have kind of motion sensors because that kind of moves on to the next thing. We protect, so I wanna try and stop people getting in, but then I need to detect. So if someone has got in, we well, have yeah, strong lock, um, et cetera, et cetera, helps protect. Then I want to know if the door has been opened, the window's broken, um, if someone's in the house. And then there's obviously a response, a response if someone's in the house, or well, maybe I try and drive them away. I set my two little Yorkie poos on them, which is unlikely to do very much. Uh, I try and retrieve my property. And let's think about that side. So obviously ransomware is a big deal right now getting back our property. Now, if someone took a chair or a television, generally who cares about that? Because I can replace it, I have insurance. But let's think about something more personal to that. Let's imagine for a second, maybe sitting in here is my diary. So in here I have my diary. Now that diary is something that I couldn't easily replace. Maybe there's particular information in there. I could think like PII, so personally identifiable information. Maybe it's my intellectual property. I have my cookie recipe in there, and that's key. Only in that diary I have my cookie recipe written. I need that to do my business. So I could think about, well, this is very hard to replace. So there's one aspect, oh, if someone took my diary, uh, well, I would pay to get that back. So it's like, okay, well, yeah, I would definitely pay for that. And that's what we think about from a ransomware perspective. We think, oh, they've encrypted our data, done something, we're paid to get it back. But there's really more to it than that. Now, hopefully my diary is locked away somewhere. It's in a different room. I segment things. Maybe I write it in a special language that only I have the special key to. But let's say, for example, hey, they, they got that diary. So, hey, I want it back. But also there's an element they could read my diary. Now, if they read my diary, they know the content. So now I can think about things like reputation because they might threaten to share what's in the diary with someone else. They might think also about, oh, selling my IP. So it's not just reputation, it's now, oh, well, it puts my business at risk. So I would kind of pay to stop that. There might actually be info in my diary about others. I might write about my friends, people I've worked with. And if you think about it, if they had that information, that might help them compromise other people because now they know information about them. They could pretend to know them kind of from a spear phishing perspective they could interact in other ways. Also, there might be info on other resources I have. I might write in that diary, oh, this is where I've got X, Y, or Z. 
So now they not only have my diary, they have other things as well. All of these things I kind of want back. Now I can think about, what if I had a backup of my diary? What if, hey, yeah, I photocopy it periodically and put it somewhere else? Well, great. Um, yeah, sure, a backup would help with this item. Okay, don't give my diary back. I don't care. Um, what about this? Here, a backup does not help me. They've got my content. Even if I can get my data back, if they have it, well, hey, my reputation, that IP element, they could share, sort of falls into this, backup doesn't help. They can share that with other people. They can use information they know to maybe compromise my customers, my partners, my employees. Maybe they've gathered other information. So realize, even if I have backups, it doesn't stop the entire threat. They can still do other things. And even if I pay, even if I get it back, what's to say they didn't copy it? What's to stop them threatening me again to release these things because they have that data? Now also think about my house, outside of the diary. If they were in my house, what's to say while they were in the house they didn't find a key? So essentially at this point they could come and go in the future whenever they want. They leave something there, they can come and go. Maybe they sell it to someone else who can now come and go into my house. I have resources in my house. I have my internet connection, I have power. Or maybe they charge their phone, they eat my food, they leave a Wi-Fi plugged in and can now access the internet from my connection whenever they want. So now they can use my resources, I wouldn't know. They might even threaten to block access to my house, say, hey, give me money or I'm not going to let you in, kind of the, the, the bully thing. So when I think about the all-up picture, it's really not just about, oh, getting something back. It's, well, there's all these other problems. So yes, I have to think about, hey, maybe they've left kind of a key so they can access again. Use my resources for other things. And again, they might use that to sell to other people so other people can leverage those things. So it's far more about just, hey, get my diary back. They can do other things with that information. So I want to protect, I mean, hopefully the point I'm trying to get through, and we're going to go talk about technology in a second, the response may really be too late. It's really about protecting and detecting before things actually happen. So I really want to focus on that protection, because if they've got my diary, I'm really in a bad position. I have to be careful then, who has keys to the house? Who has a key to get into my house? And think about other ways to get into the house. Well, maybe I've got a strong key, a biometric um, to get in my house as well. We have windows. I mean, I could put bars on them, but then maybe it's horrible to actually live there. Also, well, maybe I have a garage. Well, that garage actually has a door into my house as well. I'd make sure I had maybe a lock on that door so someone got in the garage, they can't then move into the house as well. I think about segmenting the various bits of access. Uh, my car. My car doesn't look like this. But you have a car. Well, does it have kind of a garage opener in the car? Well, then I kind of have to protect the car as well. There's a way in. Who can open the door? Hey, maybe you have a kid and your kid, can they reach the door? Maybe you have a security latch so the kid cannot open the door because do you trust your children to know who should or shouldn't come in the house? What should or shouldn't be allowed to actually come in? So I'm sure you get the idea. Um, the, I, there's, there's property I care about, there's things that I can't replace, but it's not just about getting it back. If someone else has had access to it, what can they do with the information? What can they do to get access again? What can they do with my resources? There are different entry points and I have to consider all of these things. 
Okay, so let's think about technology. Uh, let's kind of map this through. Now, if I'm a company, hopefully primarily what I'm concerned about is the data. I care about my data, i.e. the stateful stuff. And obviously when I'm thinking about the equivalent of kind of my diary, well, my diary really maps to kind of that PII information, that intellectual property, stuff I really care about. Now, that could be in the form of documents. Now, think about where documents could be. Documents could be on file shares. They could be on things like SharePoint. They could be on things like users' machines. So they could be on kind of machines. Um, they could be in various other places. I might have data in databases. I might have data in my email system, my team system. There's all these other types of systems. I have to think about where is their data I actually care about. Now, when I think about things like, hey, someone stole my couch, hey, someone steals my couch, well, that ideally should be things like the infrastructure. Things, honestly, if it gets broken, think like tin soldiers, if one falls over, the point is that there's no state here. There's nothing particularly unique about this that I couldn't recreate if I really had to. Now, it's inconvenient, but I should be able to recreate it. As long as my state is protected, I think about this is kind of all stateful things, like my databases, documents, the infrastructure I should be able to recreate. So let's kind of think about that for a second. So what do we mean and how do we kind of make that a reality? So I have various kind of infrastructure elements. Now I'm thinking about Azure. Now that infrastructure could be virtual machines. It could be virtual machine scale sets. It could be Azure Kubernetes services, like worker nodes. It could be app service. I mean, there's, there's lots of other things, Azure, Batch, all of these various items. But the whole point of this, there really should be nothing special about them. All of the state, ideally, is somewhere else. And my goal here is infrastructure as code. Because if I'm doing infrastructure as code, Remember, the whole point of infrastructure as code is I'm declaratively defining what I want to be there. Now, this could be ARM JSON files, it could be BICEP, it could be Terraform. There are many different options to this. But the whole point is with that, I can recreate. So if something gets corrupted, if something's broken on my infrastructure, I can recreate it. Now, how I do that typically is, well, hey, I have some kind of pipeline. So I can think about, I have my, um, my pipeline here. So that could be my CI, CD pipeline. It might also be GitOps. GitOps might be used to actually then deploy things inside. Maybe I have YAML files up here as well and those YAML files through GitOps get deployed onto my AKS, for example, to actually go and provision the things. Now, a key point here, this automation is actually huge because think about what can happen here. This pipeline, this GitOps, well, yes, it runs as an identity. Let's say it's identity one. Only it has that identity. And if I think about this infrastructure, maybe it's deploying to a subscription, a resource group, I have things like role-based access control. That identity needs permissions. Identity one. Humans don't. Bob, John, Jill, whatever, do not need permissions on this. So when we think about things like CI CD pipelines and DevOps and GitOps, yes, it's powerful in terms of the way we deliver content, 
but it actually starts to improve our security. If I can move away from humans having rights to production, if a human gets compromised, it limits what they can do. So if I think about, hey, I have these pipelines, the pipeline runs as a certain credential, and only that credential has rights in my production environment. If a human is compromised in some way, well, they really can't do very much. They don't have the permissions. So this is really huge. And this is where things like managed identity come into this. So all of these resources here, if they want to talk to other resources, well, that's where we use things like managed identity. So managed identity is just inherent to the resource. Only it can be that resource. And so then if I have a secret, if I have something else I need, well, I can store that in things like Azure Key Vault. And in Azure Key Vault, sure, I can have secrets, things I can write and get out. I can have keys, I can have certificates, but the R back on that would only be the managed identity. Again, no humans have access. I'm gonna keep writing this. In my production environment, why do humans need access to most of these things? I wanna think managed identities, I wanna think pipelines. These identities have the permissions to actually make this work. Now, obviously, we still have humans. So if I have the idea that, hey, yes, there is a human, and this human person over here needs to go and do something to the resource, well, I want it to be privileged identity management. So the whole point of PIM, remember, is it's just enough administration, i.e. only the permissions they actually need and it's just in time. They only have it when they request the elevation and just for a limited amount of time. And the fantastic thing about this PIM is, well, hey, maybe I have another user or more who has to approve. So it, they can't just elevate on their own. Yes, they do a strong authentication, but I could still make it, hey, this is production. Yeah, I want a strong auth and someone else has to approve it. I really want to lock this down as much as possible. So even if the user's identity is compromised, ordinarily they have no permissions, they have to elevate up through a strong authentication and someone has to approve it. But ideally we, we don't want those humans in there. So it's an exception basis. So this is huge. I mean, getting to this point, if you can have these pipelines, great. Now you might be thinking, okay, John, well, that sounds good. What about the Git repo? These files live somewhere. So these files, let's say, live on uh, GitHub, for example, or Azure DevOps repos, whatever that might be. So I'm actually having here, kind of you have the idea of uh, a, a Git repo. So this is my repository. And obviously I'm only as good as, well, the repo, what's the security on that? Because remember, the whole point of these files are within that repo. Now, if someone corrupted, if someone deleted my Git repo, honestly, I mean, it's more about delete, I really don't care probably that much. Remember, the whole point of Git is it's distributed. Every developer around has essentially a full copy of the repo. It's distributed. So if someone did manage to delete my repo in some way, remember the whole point of Git is it uses the SHA hashes, so you can't change something without the SHAs breaking. If something happened to this, I could recreate it very easily. If I wanna make a change, well, I have to do a pull request. And the whole point of the pull request is, well, what do I do? I have approval gates. So before something can be merged into the main branch, that would actually update files or update my code or update anything, it goes through an approval gate, which other humans would have to approve. Same for my pipelines. Hey, I'm moving these between rings of my environment. Hey, I have approval gates here as well. 
before it can move through certain things. Now, just for a second thinking about these, realize if I have my sort of intellectual property in this Git repo, and it's on all these user machines, if that intellectual property really powers my business, I may want to be careful who can have these clones on their machines. Sometimes what you might actually do is these machines may not be regular machines. Maybe they're kind of secure access workstations. I don't want Bob on his machine at home having a full clone of the source code of my critical intellectual property. So I really have to think about that. If I'm worried about the Git leaking, I have to be worried about who can have the clone. Okay. Thinking about this again for a second, one of the big weaknesses people see is in the Git repos, people accidentally have secrets, they have credentials, they have keys. So I want to be scanning this. I'm looking for keys. I'm looking for creds. I'm looking for secrets. I, I might be, there might be code words I'm looking for that shouldn't be in there. So I can scan the repos to really check and make sure, hey, we're, we're in a good place. Now when I'm building all that infrastructure, the chances are also what you have is you're building this from kind of images. So you have some image. Now that image probably is sort of being built with again declarative um, configurations. Maybe using Azure Image Builder, for example, it uses HashiCorp Packer, and those get laid down. Well, again, if that got corrupted or deleted, you know what? I, I can recreate it that would not be a huge pain point for me. Okay, so we, we can kind of see that infrastructure thing. I'm, I'm pretty good if I prep the right way, I can recreate this, I can protect, I can use the pipelines. And one of the key things we really stressed is for our environments, we really shouldn't need humans having permissions on that. Or if they do need permissions, they're all going to be just in time, just enough, because my pipelines have managed identities, it's inherent, people can't take that identity, these can all be secured down. I can really help restrict what I can actually do through this. But the identity is the key. If we go back to our house, one of the biggest things in terms of compromise is if I get a key to the house. And remember we had the idea of, hey, the little kid, and do we kind of trust them with the key? So if the identity is this key to our house, we really have to focus, because really the identity is one of the biggest ways that people can actually compromise. They can start off with a little identity and then kind of um, look, keep an eye on, they do this reconnaissance, and they try and find other credentials, and they move around. So obviously we have our Azure Active Directory. So our Azure Active Directory contains all of our principles. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, a big thing we do is things like conditional access. Conditional access lets us say, hey, for this type of application you're trying to access, I require these checks. So maybe, hey, I require MFA, a strong auth, maybe it's passwordless. Maybe I need a healthy machine. I can check that for integration with things like uh, Intune, for example. Maybe I want to look at the user's risk. Now that risk could be in terms of the user's overall risk or an individual session risk. And this is where things like AAD, identity, protection. It's looking at signals, it's looking at anomalous behavior, it's looking at the IPs, it's looking at impossible travel. To flag, and this looks kind of weird, the interaction with this identity is not what we would kind of normally expect. So there's kind of many things I, I can kind of do here. But that conditional access is really hugely powerful. So I want passwordless, I want MFA, I want PIM. I don't want standing privileges, PIM for Azure resources, PIM for Azure AD roles, um, maybe even group memberships. So I can do all of those things. The identity protection is key. If I don't protect the identity, 
I'm, I'm losing. There's very little I can do. Now remember all of the different angles of that key. Remember, hey, my house, I can think about the front door, but then there's the garage. Um, then there's the car, because the car has a button to open the garage. So you have to think of all of the different vectors that can be used. So yeah, Azure AD, I'm going to protect that. I have these great policies. I'm having Azure AD identity protection looking at it. But most likely you have AD. And your AD is what actually populates your Azure AD. An Active Directory with Kerberos and NTLM, and maybe you've got ADFS as well. They have types of attack. I mean, there's obvious ones. There's things like, oh, was it pass the hash? I mean, there's a huge numbers. Pass the hash, there's golden ticket, there's bronze. I mean, there's all these different types of attack. I can kind of scan for DNS. There are things I can do. Well, I want to know about that. So in terms of protection here, we think about things like well, Defender for identity. Now this used to be called, so it was kind of formally known as ATP, which was the cloud version of ATA. That's going to look for types of signal. That's going to look and find hey, there's this thing happening. So this has sensors. It kind of sits inside looking in your AD. It has sensors for your ADFS and will help find, hey, look, there are these bad things kind of happening in the environment. So it's going to help protect me from those. So it, it's multiple signals. I want all of these different things. Now, I know my focus is Active Dir um, sorry, Azure, but we do have to think about the user. So I think about my kid who could open the front door, who really may not know who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. I have to protect the users in my company because again, they're kind of the biggest way in. The way in is a, a compromised identity or I get some payload on a machine and that payload then goes and kind of, again, does that reconnaissance. It's looking for things it spreads, it does lateral movement, it looks for other credentials, it uses those, and it's just going to keep moving. So I have to think about the user. Just focusing on the resources is you're, you're going to, it's not going to work. I have to think about the user. So what are the ways that the user interacts with the world? Well, honestly, a huge one is kind of their email. They get email coming in. Now think about what an email could have. An email could have links. An email could have, I could have attachments actually within there. So I click a bad link, it goes somewhere and it harvests my credentials. So I, I wanna check the links before they get to the user. I wanna check the attachments. Maybe I kind of put them in these, um, de uh, these detonation chambers. So what that actually does is it takes it and basically runs the thing and says, well, what behavior it looks, what happens when whatever is in there is actually initiated. So we don't want to just trust the user to get the email and respond nicely. We, we can't do that. So I, I want to check this because again, think about if the email was compromised in some way, well, not only can they make things happen to the user, but now maybe I could go and send to other people and spearfish them. They think it's coming from the user and again, bad stuff there. So here we think about, well, okay, we have things like Defender again. You're going to see Defender, lots and lots. Defender for Office 365. There's different sort of levels of this, but they're going to give me those features. And another nice thing I can do with this is actually train the user. I can do kind of fake emails to see if they click it or not, then use that as an opportunity to educate the user. But I have to educate the users. And that can be a great tool by doing kind of these fake phishing attempts. You're controlling it, you're seeing the behavior, and you can use that to help them. So that's kind of a big deal. 
So these detonation chambers are huge. Again, it comes back to the idea of my house. If it was my kid, um, if someone drops off kind of a great big box, I don't want my kid just bringing it into the house. Maybe it's got kind of that bad guy sitting in the box, Trojan horse ready to come in and do something. No, I'll open it out in the garden, maybe hit it with a club a few times, but I want that kind of protection. So that's what those technologies I really think about doing for me. Now the user obviously also has a machine. So the user has their machine. Now there are some obvious things we do here. We think about obviously making sure it's patched, making sure we have antivirus, making sure we have firewall, making sure we have policy, and making sure all of these things are current. Now those things equally apply to servers. It's not just a user's desktop. So all of those kind of practices there, they also apply to my servers. My server's got my little flashing lights, whatever that might be. Uh, I have to think about that as well. But even that is not enough. Kind of if something happens, the user brings in a USB drive or they click sync or they do go to a link, I want to be able to track what happened. Hey, they clicked this. It spoke to this, it started that process, it spoke to another machine, it went and scanned for credentials, it ran Mimikatz, whatever that might be. So again, we think of things like Defender for Endpoint. Because again, the whole purpose of this is all about protection, but also detection when it actually happens. So I need to know, and that will give me that forensic tracking of, hey, this happened and this happened. Because the point is, if some bad payload gets somewhere, it's now going to kind of sit and watch. It wants to do a lateral movement. It's looking for other credentials. It's looking for um, vulnerabilities. I'm looking for those types of things. So I'm looking for, hey, uh, I see these other things. Maybe I can try and do an RDP brute force attack against another machine. So now, hey, great, I found another machine that I can now go and get to, and I'll infect that. And then I'll go to another and another, and I'll find better credentials and machines with better things. So it's constantly trying to do that lateral movement. And again, if I have the tools that help show me the tracking of what happened, and maybe I can catch it quick enough, it can alert me and do those things. Again, think of the whole diary again. If my diary was taken and they found information about my friends, well now they could maybe trick them into thinking they know them, whatever that might be. And I'm saying defender for endpoint. There's other types of extended detection and response XDR tooling I could leverage, but I want something to look for the signs of attack and be able to respond. Is someone cleaning event logs? never a good sign, looking for certain things to happen. So I have all of these different things to try and protect. But remember our point is assume breach. Um, we try and limit what the credentials can actually do. That really is kind of a, a key point to this. You try and trust, no trust nothing. If they get a foothold, hopefully it can't go very far. But if it does, we want to be able to track what's actually happening. So really try and segment. Remember the garage? Um, maybe I've got a separate room for the diary. If one bit gets compromised, I did it, it's hard to get to the next bit. At least we're trying to slow it down. So you might have some opportunity to react in some way. So this was really all about the protection side of the house. Um, but let's actually think about maybe the, the resources as well for a second. So that's kind of the user. But let's actually think about stuff in Azure. What can I do to protect those as well? And I'm going to start off thinking really about, again, the public endpoints. I have some kind of public endpoint. Now, obviously, all our resources in Azure are using managed identity to get to other things. But if I have a public IP, well, if it's HTTP, for example, I want to be using App Gateway with web application firewall. Maybe I'm using Azure Front Door with web application firewall. 
I want those things. Maybe I'm worried about people threatening to take my things offline. This thing like standard distributed denial of service that I can enable on a VNet that gives me more tuned control and alerting about that. I should not have RDP or SSH or WinRM exposed. If I have to have it, then it should be things like just-in-time, where it opens up just the IP address I'm coming for for a limited window, or maybe it's things like Azure Bastion. But ideally, RDP SSH should be private. I have the idea that, hey, look, sure, I've got my virtual network. And that's kind of broken down into various kind of subnet one, subnet two, where I have resources. But I have my on-prem network. And to access those things, if it is required, well, I'm using a site-to-site -site VPN. I'm using express route private peering. That's how I get to the endpoints if I require that. My DevOps agents, I can have different types of agents that run within. I don't want public facing things. Those should be locked down. I think about things like Azure Firewall. And I want my traffic to go through the Azure Firewall and that can kind of inspect, hey, where am I going to? Because if something does infect it, it's probably now gonna go and try and talk to some bad website somewhere. Well, I don't want that to happen. So Azure Firewall would help me actually see that. And that's kind of my gateway subnet there. Use network security groups. Do those kind of segmentation so it doesn't just free flow everywhere through everything. If I have other services, maybe I have storage. Maybe I have databases, whatever that might be. Again, remember the resources have a managed identity. Only the managed identity has role-based access control permissions. But to actually go and talk to them, well, I can use things like a private endpoint. And remember, the private endpoint could also be accessed over that site site VPN or private peering. I can also use service endpoint, but that would only be usable within the subnet itself to map to particular instances of that so I can lock close down. Those resources themselves have their own kind of firewall configurations. And so I want to kind of block access from the internet. I'll only allow access from within those endpoints actually on my network. So things like those file shares, um, SharePoint, OneDrive for Business, well, there are CASB solutions, for example. I can use things like my conditional access to lock those down and control. Also, I'm thinking about access reviews. So I didn't kind of call that out there, but for all my kind of roles, um, my groups, I mean, they're kind of big ones, even my app access. Well, I could be running access reviews. Make sure who actually has these things. Make sure I don't have standing privileges. Make sure I'm using PIM and only the people that really need it actually have it. But I want to kind of block all of the resources. And again, I'll kind of stress the idea here that use managed identity. It's so powerful. Only that resource can be that managed identity, and that has the permissions. And a lot of the services now, I can do Azure AD role-based access control at the, the data plane, so I can restrict who can actually access that thing. Again, I'm gonna say it again, no humans. Why do they need permission to my production database? Definitely not standing. If they need it, it's for some exception basis, make it PIM, sure, but that should be really what it's limited to. So I think protection, protection. I protect the endpoints, the windows, the doors. That's all about protecting, really limit what I can see. And if they get in, hey, I'm limiting where it can go. That's kind of a key point. So all of this, all of this has really been about protection. Everything we're doing here was protection. So let's 
now talk about detection. How do I know something's happening? That's going to be giant compared to the rest of it, isn't it? Where I wrote protection up there. All right. But now we're focused on detection. This is important because if I can respond quick enough, there might be something I can do. If we think of the chain of events, the chain of event is there's going to be some compromise. Now this could be a compromised identity, or it's a system. So some identity got breached, or someone clicked on something, or something happened, or maybe the identity got breached, which would then lead to a system. But there's some compromise. Then, well, they're, they're taking things, maybe they're deleting things, maybe they're deleting backups, if you're thinking about kind of the ransomware. Maybe they're deleting snapshots. But again, I do want to emphasize these ransomware people, they're companies today and they're, they're smart. They have great tooling. They understand people have backups. So just like the diary, hey, all of those things we talked about apply to my company. It's not just, hey, give me my data back. What can they do with that data to compromise other people? And I'm going to talk more about that. But maybe they, they are focused on deleting the backups, deleting the snapshots, and then they go and maybe do the encryption. So they go and encrypt, or they move, or they corrupt. So they, they do those things. And the point I want to get to is here, in an Azure world, this is really Azure Defender. Now, there are many different SKUs of Azure Defender you're going to see. Now, obviously, there's ones for storage. There's ones for the various database offerings. And that could be Azure SQL Database. That could be Cosmos DB. That could be the open source managed database like Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB. Um, there are things for, like, for example, containers. Um, there are things for Azure Container Registry. Uh, and the kind of the list goes on. And the whole point is, these are looking for strange behavior. Hey, look, someone's suddenly doing lots and lots of access to these things. They're deleting things. That's kind of unusual. So this is kind of looking for strange anomalous behavior. And kind of alerting me to that. Then we have things like Defender for ARM, Azure Resource Manager. And again, think, if someone starts deleting a whole bunch of objects, hey, strange behavior will alert. Uh, I can look at people looking at my DNS records. There's Defender for DNS. So again, you're thinking about this strange behavior in terms of activity. Maybe the identity that's actually doing it. Maybe the IP address it's doing it from. And remember things like Azure AD Identity Protection, Think of the Defender solutions. They're all looking at all of those different things. And what these can then do is they build into kind of Azure Security Center to feed in kind of these alerts and then some kind of action. I can really kind of bring all of these different things I want to act. Now, you'll also obviously think about Azure Sentinel. So I have Azure Sentinel. That sits on top of log analytics. So that can help me kind of hunt. That can help me investigate. It is the kind of sim and saw. It can help me act. So I can bring those alerts in. I can then do those. There's a whole bunch of stuff I can do in Azure Sentinel. But it's going to help me respond and maybe automate that. So again, my point is, I want to do this as quick as I can. I really don't want to be at the stage of, oh, it's happened now, how do I respond? And they've kind of done everything. You're in a bad place. You're hurting at that point. It's hurting anyway, but you're hurting even more. So the Defender solutions are really all about helping me detect, see, hey, look, the glass break sensor in the house has gone off, the motion sensor. Something's happening, and I want it to happen early. Because they're going to be unusual signals. It's not very common, for example, someone's trying to delete a backup vault. It's like that, that doesn't happen. So that's going to get flagged very, very quickly. 
So when those types of behaviors are, are seen, an unusual amount of pulling from a storage account, or that, like it's gonna trigger things. So I can then hopefully respond that much quicker. So let's think about that. Let's think about the response. Now think back to my diary. Uh, what, what, what am I responding to? So the threat is, hey, they encrypt my data. Okay, um, sure. To help mitigate that, I can have things like backups. I can have things like snapshots. Now the effectiveness of this, it really depends on what credential and what power they have. Because they might be able to delete that as well. I mean, that's kind of the problem. So what is this? If I'm thinking about a disk, like a managed disk, well, maybe it's in kind of a backup vault. Maybe it's a snapshot. Well, if the bad actor got the a high permission, uh, it can be deleted. Now, maybe I have something where it copies it to a different storage account where a different identity has access. I have to think about that. Maybe it's a PaaS database. Now here, that's actually quite a nice story. So if I think about things like Cosmos DB, if I think about the open source managed databases, um, SQL, well these are managed backups. I can't mess with that, even if I wanted to. For some, for a lot of these, even if I deleted it, it keeps the backup for seven days and support could restore it for me. So I'm in a, a pretty nice place there. If it was Blob, for example, well, again, I can do kind of snapshots, but again, it can be deleted. If I've got the right permissions, I can delete it. Now you might say, oh, resource lock. I'll create a resource lock. Well, can be deleted. If the identity is compromised, a lot of times it doesn't matter what we do at that point, they, they can undo it. So this is kind of my point about if we kind of are after the fact, it, it's very hard to actually respond to it. There might be things we can do, but even if we manage to, here's the point. Hey, they, they can encrypt and say, do you want this back? But they can also threaten to release. Now, that could be my intellectual property. It could be PII about my employees. I don't want that to happen. They might use the information they have to spearfish my customers, my partners, because now they've got information, they've corrupted systems, they know things that can make it seem more legitimate, they have access to systems, they can make it seem more legitimate. They can take other employee data. And what I mean by that is, hey, there's employee data from your systems, but also have they been sitting on the user's machines and are now collecting personal information about the users. They go and access these sites, so now I can blackmail the users as well. They can threaten to disrupt the business. So that there's all these different things they can actually do. Um, they could use your resources. If they're on there for a while, hey, I'm going to do crypto mining. They're on there, why not? They might sell this access to others. So then they can come and use your systems. And they might leave a C2, a command to control in place. So they can come back and, and do these things again. There is a whole business around it. These are smart people. and They have their own sets of tooling. So when you think about this, 
yes, there are certain things you can do. Maybe you take uh, backups to other services, um, you're willing to lose a certain amount of data. There's obviously things, there's things like immutable blob that, that cannot be changed. I could, for example, on blob, put actual locks on those things. And it's, it's actually a mutable lock, so it cannot be changed for two weeks or four weeks. So there are things I could actually do. But given these things, yes, I can address this one. But if the data's out, there's really not a lot I can do about that. And realize what's to stop them coming back and doing it again. So the emphasis is really about that protection and detection. Because the response, I'm really in a world of pain to really do anything useful. Uh, replication is generally not going to help with those things because it's going to replicate any corruption. It doesn't actually help. But I focus on the protection. I focus on the detection and trying to react quickly. I get the right tooling in place, the right processes in place, the right user education. Because again, if I think about those entry points, it really typically is the identity or some system clicking on something, some weak identity, the supply chain, who are your partners, who has permissions, who has permissions, why do they have the permission? In my production environments, you really want to try and move away from that. Ultimately, I don't let a four-year-old open the door. I, I, I don't give that trust. I don't let them have free range of the house. Strong protection, strong detection, hopefully that means your response will be minimal. So that was it. I mean, my goal really for this was to try and talk about some things to think about. Um, hopefully it shows it's not just about someone encrypting your data. That's one element, but it's not maybe the biggest thing. There are still all those other avenues that even if you can kind of replace your data, these, these are all still problems. So again, hope that helped. Give some things to think about. Um, take care, get some good tooling, get some help if you need it. Until next time, take care.